Right, right, let's get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, there's a lot of you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, please bear with me, there's an hour, and I had a lot of content and I was preparing this uh, presentation literally all the way up till Thursday. Uh, let's see how awake you all are. Let's do audience participation. Okay, so, raise your hands if you would say you've been in the photo fandom for a year or more. Okay, so a lot of you. That's incredible. No <laughs> shame if you yes. haven't. It's got to have new people. Okay, so keep your hands up if you can if you can say with confidence that you've been in the fandom for five years or more. Okay, a good number. How about ten years? Fifteen? One hundred. Twenty? Twenty-five. Okay, that's incredible. Uh, <laughs> some of you could be doing these talks, but you get me, so <laughs> too bad. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, think, funny thing about you get a lot. I'm not sure how many of you have actually seen like history of fairy talk before, but I've always found they were a lot focused on America because it's understandable. It did start in America. America loves to loves to share a lot of its pride and history and all all that kind of stuff. But uh, those in the UK have been around for as longer than you, you could possibly imagine. And they also have a lot of influences that, uh, that go way, way back. So, so, yeah, so back in the Victorian area, this is the closest thing that you could get to fursuits. This is pantomime theatre. And some of them were like, and yeah, some of them were really dedicated to their work. But the animals look good and would study animals to try and behave as close as they can to the actual animals. Uh, but it's not just theatre, you also have your famous story. So uh, you've got like Peter Rabbit, l uh, late 19th century, you've got Wind of the Willows, uh, you've got Animal Farm from George Orwell, you've got uh, Watership Down and from Richard Adams. Uh, there's also like, like Plague Dogs, there's another Richard Adams one that. Oh god, kind of Plague Dogs! <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't it's, probably be done by the same person. They are, they? And, yeah, it, they are and, and some needs to be hassled, needs to become films to. Some very quality, some, some being underrated classics. Washing down the view still for some reason. Yeah, there was actually a recent. There was actually a recent. There was actually a recent Washing Down adaptation that, and the first thing I didn't think, I first thing I thought was pretty good as well. And it's not just uh, you got your big novels, but you also got your fantasy stories, you got your comic books, and you got your famous children's book classics as well. So. Animals are farthing wood, that was cheerful. Yeah, animals are farthing wood! <laughs> <laughs> As if water sits down with light hearted. Everything in the air is cheerful and magical, though. Wind of the Willows is quite soft, that's how I. Yeah. It's like Red Wolf. Red Wolf is good. So, yeah. So. But there's also Bramley Hedge, and that's really strange. Hmm. So, we have a lot of our influences, but what I wanted to try to focus on was the actual fandom itself. And, and unfortunately, we do need to start with. Uh, Talk about history of the United States, that can be an hour on its own, so I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm going to just con super condense it down to this one slide. The foundation of the fandom was basically from like three groups, I'd like to put it as. You have your underground and indie comic book artists and cartoonists who, sick and tired of Disney wanting cartoon animals, they're all family friendly. That's how they would make uh, cartoons where animals would use foul language, they would be violent, they would be really into sex. Really? And you could even have deep and dark fantasy stories. You have stuff like Serve the City Aardvark. You have uh, Omaha the Cat Dancer. You also have... And so uh, that's where the first two people come. Um, and there's Reed Waller and Kate Worley. They created Omaha the Cat Dancer. And Reed Waller sets up Vooty, which was one of the uh, amateur comic book clubs from around this time of, uh, well, let's say, comic book revolution, as it were. You have the cartoon fantasy organization where you have people who are who are adults who are fans of uh, cartoons, particularly uh, anime, as it was uh, slowly making its way to the United States through uh, passionate fans importing, importing from across the Atlantic. And so you get ones like Kimber the White Lion, where here's a cartoon fantasy organization has a small furry track, very funny animal track that's exclusively for these anthropomorphic animals. Then you also had uh, science fiction fans who started gaining an interest in anthropomorphic storytelling, mainly thanks to one guy named Steve Galachi and his new comic book series called Albedo Anthropomorphics. 
you also got more comic books from this time, such as uh, Yusagi Yojinbo and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But the two people worth mentioning are the two people in the middle. There's Mark Molina and Rod O'Reilly. They were members of the Cartoon Fantasy Organization. I think Mark Molina was also one of the co-founders, along with uh, Fred Padden down there at the bottom. But he also set up, uh, basically, house parties. Uh, originally, they were funny animal parties, but once the name furry was adopted, they became furry parties, starting with uh, Wessacon 39. And it was only a year later that he decided he was going to introduce into the UK because the World Science Fiction Convention also decided to appear in the UK for the first time. And I think it was about, well, it was uh, 1987 uh, in Brighton. It was actually, funny enough, in Brighton before in 1979, which was actually Mark Molino's first UK science fiction convention, if I recall correctly. But that was way before he even knew what fact, well, before furry fandom was even a thing. Now he's actively running furry events, and so he decided to set up the first furry party. The reason, <laughs> yeah, he, he drew that himself. Uh, and, uh, yeah. The very first furry NSFWR. Uh, maybe. Uh, so, but yeah, uh, I actually got to speak to Mark Molino uh, when doing my research, and uh, I found I found and I found this quote pretty telling because remember this is 1987, not really much of an internet was around then, and furry fandom was still a very like niche thing in in America, so it was almost unheard of in the UK. So out of the 20 people, which I'm guessing at, which at the time was pretty good numbers for a furry party. If you, weren't, if you weren't the people who knew Mark Molino as a, big, uh, as a big anime buff who liked to collect anime and wanted to see some anime from, on a tiny 7-inch monitor, you came out of pure morbid, morbid curiosity and had to be explained by a bunch of Americans what, the, what, what on earth is this fairy thing. It doesn't seem to give a good impression, although uh, it, didn't seem to hit, it didn't seem to pick up the same way it did in America, so I couldn't really find any future, I couldn't really find any future fairy parties from the, from the 80s uh, that is the same way that uh, science, same in American science fiction and fantasy conventions had, would end up having fairy tracks. But there was something that did give it a little bit more of a, a better presence. Mud, MUDs and MUDs. MUDs, uh, for those uninitiated, stands for multi-user dungeons. Uh, basically, multiple computer users can just explore a text-based dungeon, fighting demons, solving quests. These were basically the very early MMOs, uh, first invented at the University of Essex in 1978. Wow. Yeah. So, but, it was because, but it was thanks to a, a bunch of university students at the University of Aberystwyth who made their own version that made it more, made it more widely available and more universities picked it up. And eventually, uh, some American students said, uh, instead of uh, just having to fight demons, why can't I just be friends with the demons? Why can't I be friends with other users? And that's where we end up getting Max. Some people use the uh, abbreviation to mean a multi-user creation kit, but it doesn't really actually have an actual acronym. But one student, uh, who the name escapes me right now, it's uh, Blue Mage, uh, who was a student at the University of North Carolina, he decided uh, to take one of his old, an old mug that was being left abandoned at his campus, and decide to make a furry mug. So, in starting in 1990, that's what we ended up getting: in furry mug, one of the early furry, <coughs> early furry themed uh, mugs. Uh, and many, but uh, furry mug is still running, and it's the oldest mug ever. Yeah. And it's also pretty impressive uh, is that there was only a limit of 63 users available online at a time, and yet there was still a strong growing community, uh, particularly internationally. Uh, in this time zone, you would have had uh, European furry fans who, who would uh, hang out at the furry mucks in like, the morning and early <coughs> afternoons, and then you'd start seeing American furry fans start appearing later on in the afternoons and in the late evenings. And a lot of the uh, British the early British furry fans, uh, uh, people who I'll probably mention later, like Silver Mage, like Foxina, they would 
they, they got their first introduction to the furry fandom through the furry max. Although it wasn't the only way, you also had uh, some more traditional fans who found their way into the e furry fandom through what would be pen and paper. They would write letters to, to other fans. They would, they would uh, order fanzines and they would contribute to fanzines. One of these was a man named Ian Curtis. Ian Curtis uh, first contributed uh, have been making contributions to fanzines as early as 1991, from what I can find, and had good contacts with uh, Brit both British and American furry fans. And he found out that a small group of American furry fans were going to be in France for a comic book, comic book festival in a place called Angoulême. And he thought, hey, you guys are going to be in France. Why don't you come to my house in England, I'll bring some furries I know uh, from around the country to my, to my house as well, and we could just hang out together. And this would be what would be, funny enough, the very first UK specific event organized by a British furry, the Housecom, as they would be called. <laughs> or, oh yeah, Microcom, yeah. Oh yes. ran for a long time, that thing. Oh, oh, it's like, technically, uh, from what I've heard, it's actually still running. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but uh, this is a bit, but this is uh, where, uh, but in a, what would be, what's described as like a 1950s three bedroom terrace house, uh, and those would like share art, they could share art, they could watch cartoons, and really into like the, also, <laughs> yes. yes. you were there, were you? Yes. <laughs> 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 I Got yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think he had that monitor because he didn't have a TV license and he didn't want to get, get accused of watching telly. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, after there was, so after another uh, furry fan by the name of Possyper, he ran his own house car at his home in Wales. And also, Ian Curtis decided to make it a more regular event, starting in 94, being a quarterly event, so it happened like once every three months. And, uh, and like I said, it's still actually running to this day, although in much smaller numbers and it's not often as advertised as much, so you have to be in the know to be part of it. But, and it also wasn't the other, only micro con of this kind, there was UK fur con. This one was advertised primarily through the Max. We also. We can puzzle thing, really. Mm. Yeah, funny enough, the uh, UK for uh, con was an uh, instance to the earliest bit of fairy drama I could find in the UK. <laughs> so the ninety, so the very first UK fur con organised by Asprin in, 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 in Colchester in ninety four, they happened to set it up on uh, the exact same weekend as the Eightly House con, and there were a and there were a couple people who ended up getting invitations to both. And so you ended up getting shouting matches within the phone marks. I was like, you're hijacking the Yaddy House Con. What, how did you do this? You're taking our offense. Turns out it was a misunderstanding. <laughs> like, I don't know if Twitter was around at that time. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, so. For, unfortunately, so. Although, another interesting thing uh, while most of the uh, attendees for UK Fur Con were British, uh, you actually had German and people are attending. Especially on the first, especially on the first two, uh, one of note, Unsi, who actually drew this early image I, could, I found on VCL. Uh, remember that art portal? Uh, uh, he once wrote that uh, he didn't he didn't know that there were he didn't really know that there were furries outside of Germany until one of his friends told him that he was meeting up with some UK furries, and uh, it was from then that. A bunch of these European, more European focused furries got together and were like, how about we have our own gathering? One that's for all of your, one that's for as many European furries as we can find. Uh, one of these guys, they have a, their parents have a, have like a farmhouse that they go on the holidays. We can use that as a space to hang out for the weekend. 
And they thought it was a good idea. And they thought, uh, how about we call it Euroforest? <laughs> and uh, it seemed to go fairly well. I mean, they did it again next year and they got more numbers. And again, with more numbers. And again, and again. And I think it's still going. <laughs> it's like, and, I mean, there's, it's going to be happening this year, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, so Euroforest. In Berlin, yeah. So Euroforest, which holds record to be the longest ongoing ferry convention, it got to start, I would like to argue, because of UK furries just wanting to hang out. <laughs> uh, take that. <laughs> so, but along with the uh, uh, British fans wanting to get in and to collect uh, fan things from America, we also had a bunch of our own, starting with uh, Ferry Furry, which was published just out of Oxford. Uh, the most successful fanzine, as well as the most successful fanzine publisher of around the 90s, were Lazy Fox Productions, that was done by Foxy, Foxina, uh, with Anthropomorphine, which ran up until 2010, if I recall. And you also had uh, United Publications, which it, uh, imported many it, books and fanzines, <laughs> scenes, as well as a uh, publisher's own. In fact, uh, it's still running today, you can and it's probably best known for selling a lot of the uh, actual Sabrina online yeah. comics and books. It's where, it's where I get my uh, it's where I got my trades or uh, the Sabrina online comics. Because uh, this is for history of fairies in the UK and not just history of fairies of England, we have to acknowledge that Scotland exists. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Scotland. Uh, very first gathering of fairies in Scotland. We also have to give credit to Mark Molino because he did a furry party at the World Science Fiction Convention when it took place in Glasgow. And this one ended up being a lot more successful this time because uh, not only was there a more established furry presence, but they actually had an event space at the actual convention instead of uh, the 1987 party which took place in like a bed and breakfast that was further down the road. And you saw, again, you had the usual sharing of furry art watching anime on a, ten, on a tiny screen. But you also had a lot more American furry fans who were eager to, go, eager to explore the UK, and so they, would, and so they hung out at the Atlee House Con and, had like, and got like their own personal tour of London and Oxford after the event. But fur, and then furries got another huge push in, uh, push in uh, organization when it came thanks to London first. <laughs> so, uh, London first started off as, a, as basically just a mailing list in 1998, but they actually, but then they started to properly meet up at around, around March, April of that year, and then decided from then to go into Holy Meads tri weekly, once every three weeks. Something they've been doing ever since. In fact, uh, London Furs is still the lot. Is still like the it's like the oldest running Fermi group out there. They would have recently had their 20th year anniversary, like last year. And in fact, even in November of last year, they were celebrating that they had run their 300th meet. Which, so it's a lot. Is that the original website? Um, captioning there? Yes, yeah, so that's actually the original website, circa 2000. Oh wow. And yeah, the website was also the main member hub as well. Um, it's where a lot of the, it's where the, well, it's where a lot of the furries would have, uh, would have had an account in the early internet days. Dial-up. <laughs> yeah, in the era of dial-up. And for some of you amusement, we have the earliest footage of actual UK furries hanging out. This was taken from a documentary uh, that was uh, aired, aired in the year 2000 called Human Furry Animals, and. One thing that always surprised me is that uh, there's a lot of makeup and face painted furries. <laughs> like, fur, like fursuits were, fursuits were already uncom were uncommon in the US and so were incredibly rare elsewhere. But uh, in London furs, they kind of made up for it. I'm guessing they must have made up for it by, by having most of their attendees wear face paint and makeup of whatever the animal they want. And that, and that would go out along with uh, whatever, like, their, whatever tails they would have handmade. I'm guessing face painting has been going for a ridiculous long time, so they probably just put, put it together and it, well, it would work easily. Mm. Yeah, but also the TV stations focus more on the less normal looking people, so I'm a bit biased there. 
That uh, uh, could be uh, that could be argued, but then I'm also uh, looking at the earlier versions of the London Fur website. They even had an entire pages dedicated to makeup and face painting. They make they they advertise as being like a common thing that's fat and found exclusively within the London Furs community. So it could, so so it could be just something that start, started off with like one or two people, but then just got then just got like a lot more of a more appealing idea later on. Where was the original um, pub with the London um, Fellows were held there? Ah, uh, it's I know it's on wiki. I know it's I know it's on wiki. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, if anyone else actually could remember that far back, I could find out for you quickly later on afterwards. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but despite uh, how popular and how far people were willing to travel to go to the London Fellows, you have people who are like. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not that too keen on traveling to London on a on a one on a one to two monthly basis. Can't it be anything that's like more close to the home? And so people just started setting up their own groups. Uh, a lot of regional groups I found. Uh, so, so one of your so the earlier ones you had like Northern Furs for like for like the Sheffield, the Leeds, the Newcastle areas. Uh, Liverpool and Manchester and Chester. The first one was actually in Chester. Oh, it was in Chester. Yeah, they had all, they did all six. So North, Newcastle had their own. Mm. It, nobody could be able to travel that far now. <laughs> 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 I mean, people still can't be able to travel that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. But uh, uh, even for mid I I got to speak. I got to speak to uh, one of the people who set up the group, and they basically just said, "Yeah, I just couldn't be bothered to go down to London, so I just set up my own group." And from there, and people just so which is set their own meet within these uh, little groups. And, all the way, and even all the way up to the late noughties, you had you had very regional specific fur groups with their, like, their own websites, uh, it's their own mailing lists. Uh, here's a fur meet from uh, 2007. This was a uh, Sheffield, if I'm correctly. So this is where first so this is where fur suits were a lot more were a lot more of a thing, and they would obviously get to a lot of uh, fun antics. Quite good quality fur suits, actually. Yeah. Oh yeah. From what I've I mean, from what I've uh, spoken to people who actually were making fursuits. Uh, fursuit making itself started bursting like popularity in like the mid 2000s because of YouTube and any intake getting a lot more fans. So tutorials on how to make fursuits were a lot more easier to find. Before before then, you were your best unless you happen to figure it out yourselves. Your the best way to learn how to make, how to make fursuits would have been if there was like a fur, like a workshop being set up at one of the American fairy conventions. And so we got to recognise all the other countries in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, we have we started getting more fur meets around uh, Scotland in, in the mid two thousands. Wales started getting meets in Cardiff, also around also around in the mid two thousands. And they and Cardiff was the primary city for Welsh furs up until Londono started getting meets up up in the north in around the, the late early twenty tens. 2010 is also where you get Northern Ireland meets, as well as a uh, actual Republic of Ireland meets. And with being the early 2000s, uh, communication started getting a lot more advanced. So you had mailing lists, either hosted directly by the furries through Critter or or from uh, or from Yahoo groups. A lot, a lot of these are old, a lot of the old old mailing lists is where I found is where I found out, like most of the dates. So so thank you Yahoo for actually keeping those online for God knows how many years. Taking no longer uh, no, uh, no, sadly. There are some. Funny enough, there are some web, old sub websites that are still hosted with a critter donate, critter.net domain name, but but mainly unless, as I couldn't really find anything about it, I couldn't really find any specific ones I could read through. Uh, but you also, uh, you have had a. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so IRC channel. So IRC channels. Yes, it was the. Yes, it was the first one. Oh, uh, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, in the defense of in his. Okay, here's the interesting thing. In the defense of the creators, uh, Yif doesn't originally mean what you think it means now. Uh, Yif originally came from a fictional language that uh, that a fairy by the name of Foxen came up from fairy mark. Yif was meant to mean like a happy greeting. To this <laughs> thing. Like and, uh, uh, I mean, if you want, to, if you want another, if you want another example, there's there's the word Yarf, which was meant to be a more neutral greeting. And Yarf is also the name of an of an old art portal. Uh, but uh, 
by the time, but, but years down the line, uh, a bunch of furries, particularly the foxes, decided to uh, decide to use a name to describe rubbing against each other. And the people who set up Yefnet, Yefnet were too late to realise this. But they realised they made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> they do, but. I'm on the of fairies is that even though we pretend to be animals, we're still human, so we still make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I thought, but as I was about to say, uh, uh, European fairies definitely got into uh, IRC, definitely around the late, late 90, partly thanks to Yifna, but more specifically thanks to, like, Fernet, uh, which was the successor, as it were. But, oh, but for UK first specifically, we kind of have UK fur.net, so you, you give credit for that. Uh, it started off as just basically just a general information website right, from 2002. And all the member data that you found from the early London fur website, that got transferred over to UK fur.net. Uh, but eventually it became a .org website and eventually set up a forum. Uh, uh, well, fairies could gather and they could easily communicate with each other <laughs> to set up fur meets. And, of events and talk about like conventions coming up. Uh, speaking of which, so by the time of the late 2000s, we were get UK furry fandom was already getting into the hundreds, and because and with that popularity and with the amount of events that are happening around the world, people started asking the question, why don't we have our own con? And not just people hanging out at someone's house. Or people just hanging out at a bar somewhere, but an actual con. One that, one that we keep on hearing about out in the States. Or one that we keep on hearing about in Germany. And well, in the later 2000s, there would be more, there would be a few more European conventions. You had like uh, Franference, I think you had a Zillicon on later on. But uh, uh, most of the time, if you wanted to go to a convention, you'd have to travel to the States which is pretty pricey. It was a, so a bunch of people decided to make an attempt to set up their own con. And funny enough, they all shared a similar name. Brettfer. <laughs> Not sure how many people actually recognize the name Brettfer, but there were actually quite a few attempts on the name Brettfer. It was a meme that there will never be a UK furry con because everybody who organizes it will make a disaster of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a meme for so long. Mm. Uh, this, uh, a group of long, uh, the long-time London furs, such as uh, Anti Car, Marconi, Ultraviolet, they tried to set up a, a, a Brit fur to take place at Peckerton Castle in Cheshire. And you can see they even got as far as like doing mascots and having it all designed and look nice and nice to build up hype. They could, but none of them had any real experience of actually running a convention. Running a fur meet is a bit different to running a convention. <laughs> I think it's safe to say. Uh, so that interest kind of died down, particularly when it comes to uh, trying to rate, because it was the people who organized it realized they couldn't exactly afford to run it. You then had Brit Furcon, uh, which later changed the name to Furcon UK. This one was set up by uh, other prominent phone members at the time. Uh, unfortunately, most of the organization seems to happen on a web form, which I can't find any access, which no longer exists, it's all, all the links were dead. Uh, but the most I could find was that uh, they were trying to get it uh, to run in uh, early 2005, possibly in Wales, uh, at Markham County Park. Unfortunately, that one died out of interest, and the day passed, no furry con took place. Then you have Britford, then you have Britford 2005. Uh, this time, you had a, you had a furry named Tiff of Taylor, who, and who had this, is very clearly professional looking website and wanted to set up a very con in Manchester. But uh, very little updates were being made. The date passed. It ended up being delayed to 2006. And when that date passed, people started getting a little bit suspicious on whether this con was actually taking place. There's, like, there's actually an interesting debate eh, that you could find on Wikifur where people were deciding whether this con was actually real or not because uh, they wasn't sure that the hotel actually exists. If anyone was actually contacted via <laughs> Guest of Honor. Are there any kind of like control for this <laughs> convention at all? Outside of Tippers Taylor's, no one really knows. 
I mean, some people argue that because Tipper's Tales had, had his own website where he claimed he was like, where he, where he claimed to be like a big engineer, was part of a massive multi-million dollar industry, that he was just a prat, that he was just a jokester. So people, saw, so people saw, some, some people just took on suspicion that oh, this was just completely fake. So Taylor's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, Taylor himself argued that uh, he did start it off as a joke, and but but because he got so much attention for it, decided. I want to try and make it real, but how how seriously we can take that, we will we'll probably never know. But we were finally starting to get promises when we go back to London. See, London fur meets they had they used to have a traditional win, winter event where there'd be a Christmas meal. Furries would go together, they would go to a nice restaurant, and they would have a nice free course meal, have a good time. But London Fur Meets were getting too big, and no one was, and people weren't really that keen on actually organising a uh, Christmas meal in one year. But one of the new organisers, uh, Rapido Frog, he still goes by the name, I think, under the name Rubber Froggy. He decided, he decided, uh, he was going to try, he was going to try and run a Christmas event himself, but not a Christmas party. He was going to do a party on a boat. On the River Thames, oh, and, he, yeah. and he was going to call it Red, Blue and White. So the very first RBW uh, to, was a boat party that had uh, 85 tickets available and they were all completely sold out. People were really keen on this idea, particularly because they also had live music and they also had a, had a live performance from a then well-known well American fairy comedian by the name of Tudor Ranting Griffin. This is before well, well. <laughs> he was well known at the time. Not so much now. Uh, but he, but I mean, it seemed to go really well, and people seemed to really like it. So they figured, let's do it again this. Year. Let's do it again next year. But how about we make it a little bit bigger? How about we also uh, have a, a day of events at a bar and make it somewhat like a con? And so next year, we basically had a. And we basically had a con-like event for RBW in London. <coughs> Although, uh, whether or not you call it an actual event, I guess is up to debate because uh, there were because articles I could find at the time they still described it as a meet. I'm not sure if it was a purely intention to say, "Hey, this boat party is going really well. Let's turn it into a full convention." Uh, so I'll just leave it up to there. But when we, if we go back to 2005. Now a bunch of other furries who all held to, who had experience at running furry meets around the country. They saw what was uh, going on with the organisations and thought, "Yeah, we could give it a shot." And this time they actually had a little. They actually had some added help. They actually had people who actually ran conventions around the world to offer advice to. They even secured it. Even secured a youth hostel in Manchester. So even then, there were some skeptics. I mean, as it was pointed out, it was pretty much a meme that that UK would probably never get a furry con organised. It would just be expected to fail. You also had some uh, skeptics as when it came to uh, the registration system at the time, because re in order to be at the convention, you essentially you kind of you essentially had to get a room at the youth hostel. There were only a very limited set of atten attending spaces, which kind of irked some people the wrong way. But they actually did it, and it's confuzzled. The event you're at now. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, you have uh, 136 people attended. Very small numbers at the time. Very small number now, but that was a that was a big number at the time. <laughs> and uh, it seemed to go off as being a rolling success. They even raised uh, over a thousand pounds for the Badger Trust. Charity. Is that why the um, main character was a badger? Ah. Um, it might be. I'm not, I feel like I feel like they, based on like some of the later, much later articles, they kind of wanted bad. They kind of thought a badger, a mascot, would be suited for the UK because it's the badger. British it's a very traditionally animal. British animal. It's not like a fox, which uh, everywhere. which is which are which are everywhere. But now that we have a, but now we have one successful convention. Uh, RBW, they decided, hey, we want to be a fully residential convention too. And an interesting thing I found 
they kind of had to make it clear to people that they weren't going to be competing against each other and instead they were going to have to help each other. This statement appeared on both the RBW and Confuzzled websites uh, back in 2008. I'm not sure there was any question or debate or they just wanted or they just wanted to put it out there for the sake of, hey, we want to help each other, we want to bring events up. But you also, had a you also had some members of staff who did work at both conventions. One, ex one example, if I can recall off the top of my head, Matt Lyon, who is the current chairman of Confuzzle right now, he was the head of ConOps at the first Confuzzle, as well as head of security at RBW. I'm sure, I'm sure Matt Lyon might be able to refute that if he hears this. But RBW happened. And for the next few years, we had two main conventions, which is a huge improvement from a few years ago when we had none. <laughs> Unfortunately, in 2011, though, RBW end, ended up being cancelled because mainly due to financial reasons. We had the market crash, we had uh, London being becoming more expensive to host an event each year. But uh, it's not like we were going to be stuck with one convention for very long because ScotiaCon meant and we, ha we also have a convention in Scotland. Scot the first ScotiaCon was fairly small at the time. It was, I think, only 50 people attended, but, uh, but people definitely liked it. And, and uh, I think the most recent one is over 300. So it's still going fairly strong. Oh yeah, that was from the, t that was from the actual teaser trailer for the first ScotiaCon. And so from then we had a, uh, we ended up getting more events. We had campsites. So UK Fur did start off of running a camping event back in 2008, but they decided to make it a more, they decided to make it a more, or bigger event, starting off in 2011 called First of All, and it's still running this year. Uh, we also have a uh, fur dances. Uh, there was one that started in Manchester, I think, in, uh, in 2009, but uh, the very first big one that actually got, it actually got success was Frantic Euphoria, which ran for a couple of years, it was until, I think, 2014. And then we got Club Animals, which started uh, only a few years ago, and, and usually runs uh, after the Manchester Fair meets. And as we get to the 2010s, uh, the, regional group, the regional fair groups of yesteryear, they decided to, uh, they mostly disbanded, and what took its place is now major cities basically have their own Fermi organizers, their own Fermi groups, they're all with their own like fancy logos, their websites, their telegram groups. I think so, that in Furs Yeah. Is that Stafford's Furs in the bottom left? Yep, that's the Stafford's Furs. Mm. Yeah, Stafford Furs was actually Stafford for Stafford from Birmingham Furs were actually the first two furry <coughs> meets that I regularly attended. It's not Stafford Furs is kind of a, unusual because it's a town instead of a city with a furry meet. But when you had a university that was had a very strong tech campus, uh, furries tend to follow. So uh, I'm sure how many of you, you can just recognise just from the logo, and not just from reading the actual names of them. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it wasn't too long. It wasn't too long that uh, we decided two conventions wasn't enough, so we got more. So once like so, mostly in the south. Uh, the first two big ones, both interesting, starts in the southwest. Uh, I mean, you have for, I mean, vacation for. I mean, vacation followed basically off the back of Frank to Euphoria, to be more of a Butland style event instead of just a traditional con. On. And then you had Jeffy, which deliberately intended to be a small UK convention because they felt Confuzzle was going too big. And they're still and they're still running, and there's still a few more tiny ones around the way. Like uh, uh, earlier last year, I went to, I went to a brand new one that was set up called Wild North, and uh, which is uh, really up north. Uh, it was like not like even north and then Newcastle with a three and a half hour drive. Yeah. Worth it though, uh, and it's going to be carrying on next. It's going to take place uh, later this year at Feverson Castle, but I'm sure there'll be more events coming along. So yeah, basically we've had a long history. 
and a long legacy, and we've grown so big. This was the Bowie Parade from back in 2008. This is 10 years later. <laughs> That's how much we've grown. Are you trying to see where you, where you are on the photo? <laughs> I mean, I can put this... This is last year's a confuzzle. I mean, I can easily see where I am, because I'm the only one with a shiny mask, but... <laughs> so, uh, I think what... So, I, so, I did say earlier that uh, America seems to love sharing its fairy history, but... I think it's safe to say with how long we go and how quickly we've grown, I think... I think they're not the only ones that should really be proud of how far they've come. If you're ever interested in a reading about, the fir about like fairy history, uh, this is my reading list. I'm so sorry that the projector makes the text kind of blurry. But uh, I definitely recommend the two books you see on the right. You have, a, you have, a, you have, you have Fairy Founder Conventions, which basically details, like, which basically has information on practically every fairy convention that has ever been, ever been organized between uh, 1989 and 2015. It was done by the late Fred Patton. Uh, and Fairy Nation, which is, a very, which is a very thorough book on mainly the history of the US fandom. And funny enough, the, it was the subtitle, which, said, which says it's the true story of America's strangest subculture that kind of got me on the inspiration to researching in the UK fandom two years ago, because, I, because the way I see it, it, fairy fandom is not an American subculture. We don't, and we don't listen to. We don't just listen to the Americans. We're an international subculture. We have our own way. A lot of German first. The reason you're referring to that was in Germany. It was a voting system on the members mm. because there were so many German first. It was always there. Yeah, except except for the except for those except for those few years where I was in yeah. Holland and yeah. Czech Republic. That's like mostly it. Germany now. Yeah. They screwed up one year and they held up this lovely castle in a forest mm. and then had to put signs up saying not to go outside in fursuits because it's hunting season. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> oh god, no. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Because that's mostly... Yes. Actually, I just wanted to ask, um, if we want to like, watch it again, anything, do you have stuff online anywhere? Um, yeah, I, I do plan to have it online. I've, I've kind of got a recording on audio and I'll try and uh, get a video up on YouTube. I'll, tr I'll share it out. Great. Okay. Great. Um, you know the old show Animal um, Magic, which was in Bristol Zoo, and there's a guy pretending to be a zookeeper, and he would voice all the animals? Oh, God. Vaguely, yeah. 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 He was a member yes. of the South West Anthropomorphic Society, but I haven't been able to find anything about it, and whether there was any link to fairies. Well, this is the first. This is the first time I've heard about it, so I'm going to have to look this up. Yeah. So, so obviously, it was interested more in anthropomorphism in a wider sense than we typically think of as fairies. Mm. But I wonder if there's any link. I mean, it's possible. I mean, I mean, it's not. I mean, uh, there were. I do know there were a couple of groups that were that weren't just purely fairies, but they were more interested in the whole idea of uh, uh, animal spirituality and anthropomorphism. Uh, Scotland had one called Scott Beasts, that was a specifically more to do with a, not only just fairies but spirituality, whereas other kin. Uh, in the Human Fairy Animals documentary you saw, you also had uh, people who were more exclusively into wares and believing that they were animals, that they were wolves trapped in human bodies. Mm. But, but this was more aimed at people who thought that Animals should be anthropomorphized because that's a good way of defending us. If we, under, you know, if we like them and understand them, mm. then we'll protect them more. You know, like David Attenborough looking into the eyes of that gorilla and saying it looks like just like a human. Ah, that's okay. Like well, I'm, 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 afraid I'm, I'm afraid I don't have any information on me, but it's something I would love to look up. Yeah. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> Before you had like all the famous um, social medias and YouTube, how would you actually go about discovering all of this? Um, Stuff if you had enough word of mouth or anything like that. Um, normally, any. Yeah. 
Because any furry animal talk that they, they come from a very kind of crude YouTube or social mm. media, but obviously that didn't exist back then, so and uh, it was very niche and no one probably really mm. talked about it. So how, I mean, would you really gather people up um, without that level of platform you have today? I imagine it wouldn't be impossible, but it would be very difficult. I've uh, the uh, very early nineties furries that I spoke to, they uh, they admitted that they were mostly fa they either found it out of a pure accident or more of a curiosity. Like they just randomly found out that there was furry muck and and looked into it and started got and started to enjoy it when they actually got to check it out. You had Usenets like a uh, alt fan furry, which pro which uh, you probably would have only been able to find if you just happened to be looking through Usenet Usenet posts and databases at the time. Because you have a long we have a long relationship of uh, of like humanizing animals, uh, make and making uh, and making cartoons with animals that walk like humans or talk like humans. You would have had people who would have liked these things and would have wanted to find places to talk about it, and that probably would have eventually led to some degree to furries. So yeah, to answer your question, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I can ima I imagine at the time you just needed to be have the interest and just have to stumble on the right place in the right time. <laughs> Who would grab anybody who's interested in cat girls and say, mm. hey, here's yeah. this. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, in the British anime, I mean, British anime fandom, that's a story on its own. It got, it got most of its start, interestingly, from uh, toys, toys being imported from Japan. And uh, as well as uh, some, some very dedicated business, pe business folks who just wanted to import anime across. Uh, yes. Yeah, very different topic. Uh, she introduced it in, in the science fiction conventions as well, and started uh, running conventions like Sheffield Anime Day. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, so like in America, there's you know a lot of um, fans can be attributed back to you know, cartoons like you mentioned, Ninja Turtles, Spot Cat, that kind of thing. Mm. I can't think of anything that we had here in the UK that would really be like oh, I was really into. Bagpuss, Sonana Furry. Watership Bears? I don't know, I don't know. Wind in the Willows? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Super Tech. Oh, yes, Super Tech! Yes! I mean, like I said in the earlier slides, as UK, I mean, there was a lot of UK media that definitely would have had its influence on, not only on, on, Possibly British fans, also American fans as well. So I'm guessing. So I'm guessing it's not like far out there. I'm, I mean, understandably, it's, it probably wouldn't have had a big of a presence because America likes to make everything big. But I'm sure. But I'm sure it would have existed. I'm not sure about bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> My new persona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anything you want? Anything curious you want to ask about? Yeah, do you think you could? Um, you probably would be able to find where the um, first London Meat was held then. I would, uh, I mean, do I have, I can look at, I can quickly look it up online. <laughs> no. It would take you ages, but... Because it doesn't, it doesn't, it didn't look like Fleet Street, so it wasn't, it wasn't Fleet Street, so it's been a new place to... Ah, I found it. Uh, they were they were congregated at Soho Square, and then uh, the pub. And then the puzzle they went to were called the ship or the intrepid fox. Oh. Fitting. <laughs> uh, yep. Un most un ooh. Oh wow, that's a good one. Uh, most unusual. Most of probably like the furry camping. I mean, I mean, holding a furry convention in the castle is awesome, but. <laughs> 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 
that would that does, that would sound very unusual for me. It's and even just uh, the idea of just like doing having your convention mostly take place on a boat, I guess would have been a far fetched idea yeah, back in the mid two thousands. I'm surprised there's not been a cruise ship um, furry convention. Yeah, but I would that probably cost millions to host. Mm. <laughs> but that would be amazing. I'd pay for that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, Um, so um, unfortunately we're reaching the end, but thank you all for coming, thank you for listening. <laughs>